listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 21st, 2023, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, our orientation series continues on allergen immunotherapy. Our presenters are Dr. Artie Pandya and Dr. Jay Portnoy. They're in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. All right, um, so welcome everybody um, to the second hour of our COLA presentation here on uh, July 21st. Um, Dr. Arthi Panja is going to be speaking about allergen immunotherapy today and uh, with the assistance from Dr. Jay Portnoy. Thank you. All right, everybody, welcome to our lecture on allergen immunotherapy. Um, today, we are going to have both myself and Dr. Portnoy speak about this topic. Um, relevant disclosures, Dr. Portnoy is a speaker for Th Thermo Fisher, and I don't have any relevant disclosures. Our learning objectives today include being able to select the appropriate um, individual or candidate to receive allergen immunotherapy, developing an extract for treatment given the patient's history and sensitivity pattern, and how to safely administer. Um, lar a large part of this discussion is going to be surrounding subcutaneous immunotherapy. We will make some mention about other immunotherapy modalities as well. All right, let's go through these case scenarios. A 12-year-old with nasal allergies lasting two weeks during oak pollen season um, presents to you. Um, does this patient need allergy shots? Uh, Dr. Portnoy, any thoughts about that case? Yeah, I would think two weeks during oak season, just take some antihistamine for two weeks and be done with it because allergy shots is a year-round treatment. So I probably would not recommend it for this patient. All right. And that approach um, certainly, you know, can be there, especially if you can medically manage the patient. If the patient gets outside of um, the ability to medically manage them, you can certainly consider it. But you do have to also, you know, weigh the risks of the therapy, which, um, like you mentioned, in someone who's only having symptoms for maybe two weeks, you just got to have that discussion with the family on whether it would be beneficial. Next case, a four-year-old with nasal symptoms that occur in episodes lasting seven to 10 days that are not, uh, that are more frequent in the fall, no symptoms between episodes. What do you think, Dr. Portnoy? I think this kid's getting colds, <laughs> you know, because the allergen doesn't come and go every two weeks. It, it, it doesn't even make sense that the allergen is the, is the cause. So I, I would probably not give this patient allergy shots. It speaks to also our previous talk on testing. You know, you can certainly have sensitization on testing, but it's got to cor clinically correlate with the patient's symptoms in order for them to have the most benefit from this therapy. And then lastly, we have a 14-year-old with chronic urticaria and dermatographia who has numerous positive skin tests for allergens, but only minimal nasal symptoms. I'll take this last one. Um, we are going to extensively discuss the appropriate indications for allergen immunotherapy. And while chronic urticaria and dermatographism can be, um, you know, significant diseases that do cause patients to be, um, you know, have, have symptoms and be distressed from their symptoms, we also have to offer appropriate therapies that are going to clinically benefit them. Um, and currently, Chronic urticaria and dermatographism um, don't are not indications for allergen immunotherapy, but we will talk yeah. about that going forward. I, I think my other point was that if they have dermographia, that may be why they have numerous positive skin tests. They might not actually be allergic to the things; they might just be having showing demonstrating dermographia. Very true. Next uh, case scenario: a two-year-old with asthma. Uh, triggered by colds, dust mite, and mold presents to you. Does this patient need allergen immunotherapy? Um, I, I mean, if it's triggered by colds, but not by the other things, probably not in a two-year-old. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about somebody on that young. Very good. And then the last two, a 13-year-old with severe nasal and lung symptoms um, comes to you um, and develops these symptoms when exposed to cats specifically. She um, or they love animals and they want to be a veterinarian. 
Now we have somebody who has clinical symptoms um, correlating with an exposure. Um, and depending on what their aeroallergen testing suggests or shows, I should say, uh, perhaps this may be someone appropriate for allergen immunotherapy. In the last case, we have a 16-year-old with perennial nasal allergies and asthma that are worse from the spring through early fall. So a couple things, you know, we the, the case scenario here says um, perennial nasal allergies and that worse in the early spring through fall. So if this patient does undergo immunotherapy, we do want them to, um, their testing, you know, to kind of correlate with that pattern. They should have sensitization to perennial allergens as well as um, uh, ones that uh, kind of pop up seasonally as well. Otherwise, um, yeah, you want to make sure that that testing and immunotherapy for this individual is correlating with their symptom pattern. What conditions improve with allergy immunotherapy? Another, um, you know, question for this is what conditions are currently, you know, approved for um, allergen immunotherapy? We, of course, have um, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, which we talked extensively about renaming to nasal dysfunction syndrome. This is also commonly referred to as hay fever, um, uh, just in terms of, you know, patients can definitely describe it that way. Allergen-induced asthma is definitely a condition um, for which you could have benefit with allergen immunotherapy. Atopic dermatitis, we're going to talk about this. Um, there is some data uh, showing that atopic dermatitis can be benefit from allergen immunotherapy, but it depends on the allergen that they're sensitized to and, again, whether that allergen correlates with, um, you know, the flares of their atopic dermatitis, for instance. We know that hymenoptera hypersensitivity um, and fire ant hypersensitivity are approved indications as well for allergen immunotherapy. Oral allergy syndrome, what a great point that we have here. Although this is not a indication by itself to do um, allergen immunotherapy, um, there is data with individuals who have coexisting nasal dysfunction syndrome or allergic rhinitis and individuals who do have oral allergy syndrome that there could be some benefit. However, it's not conclusive at this time um, and it is not currently an indication for aeroallergen immunotherapy. And then, of course, um, indications outside of ATP, including mosquito issues, autoimmune diseases, are um, brought up by individuals, they ask you, you know, is this an indication for allergen immunotherapy? But these individuals are unlikely to benefit from allergen immunotherapy with their diseases. Dr. Portnoy, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, but, you know, it is possible to be allergic to mosquito. There's a blood test for it, yes. but there's no treatment for it. And nobody's ever had anaphylaxis for mosquitoes, so there's really no reason to treat it. Yes, you can't, absolutely. Can't anyway, even if you wanted to. Absolutely. Great point. Um, this is the point that I added here. So what immunologic changes does the individual undergo when you undergo immunotherapy? This is presuming, of course, that they have sensitization with an allergen-specific IgE, either determined based on skin prick testing or on um, serum testing. What we do see in individuals who go undergo immunotherapy, we see an initial increase in allergen-specific IgE levels when they're, um, again, initially in, um, on the therapy. Subsequently, over time, we see that those specific IgE levels do decline. We do see increases in IgG, specifically IgG4 levels. And then lastly, we see allergen-specific IgA levels um, increase as well. So these are some immunologic changes that we can see with allergen immunotherapy. Who needs allergy shots or allergy immunotherapy? What are the criteria? So you have to have currently a condition that, you know, is going to improve with the allergen immunotherapy. So we talked about some of those indications for aeroallergens. And then, of course, with hymenoptera, you have to have um, a clinical scenario in someone who has essentially undergone um, a systemic reaction. Uh, previously with hymenoptera, and I know this is getting outside of the scope of this slide, but with hymenoptera allergy, we used to say um, uh, individuals who had urticaria and angioedema could also you know, undergo immunotherapy, but now uh, the, the new kind of data has shown that individuals with systemic reactions are going to benefit from um, venom immunotherapy. 
Second point here, evidence that relevant allergens trigger the condition. So again, this speaks to both of our talks today. You can have a positive test, but is it clinically relevant to the patient? And you can only determine that based on taking a very accurate history. Um, symptoms are not adequately controlled with avoidance. Um, so practically, when I talk to patients about, you know, if, if they have something that they're sensitized to on a skin or blood test and, you know, they're coming to you uh, with clinical symptoms that match that skin or blood test, how can you treat that individual? There's three major treatment options. The first includes aeroallergen avoidance. The second includes medical therapy, which we touched on in our rhinitis as well as our asthma talk. And the third is immunotherapy. So if they're already uncontrolled with the first two measures, then certainly immunotherapy is something to think about, um, which brings us to the next point here. Medications are not adequate. So even if the medications could be adequate, if they're on the medications all the time and the families have a desire to avoid long-term use of medications, um, that could be an indication for immunotherapy as well. And then lastly, the patient desires to get allergy uh, shots despite the hassle and expense. Um, so if there is a strong motivation uh, to get immunotherapy, of course, that is going to lead more to more success um, in individuals. So if you're advocating for a therapy that ultimately the families or patients, I should say, don't want, um, you may not see good compliance in those patients. Um, so yeah, we want to have that full discussion with the patient prior to proceeding. Any thoughts, Dr. Portnoy, about this? I think it's, it's important to have a complete discussion, including the pros and the cons, so that the patients know what they're in for. If they don't realize what's involved with allergy shots or immunotherapy, uh, and they start it, they might not follow through with it. And then what, what have you really accomplished? So I think that that's exactly right. Absolutely. Who should not get allergy shots? So firstly, <clears throat> medical conditions that increase the patient's ability to survive a systemic reaction, um, including all of these that are listed here, um, uncontrolled asthma, CAD, um, as well as treatment with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, mastocytosis, autoimmune diseases, cancer. Um, now, I will say, um, having treated uh, lots of adults with um, AIT before, um, the, the heart disease is not necessarily a, a hard contraindication, but of course, any uncontrolled um, cardiac disease, you would certainly have to take pause um, because you have to make sure that also if an individual underwent a systemic reaction, the treatments for the systemic reactions would not cause undue risk onto the patient. Treatment with beta blockers, this is also one that's a little bit, you know, we have some risk benefit discussions as well. Um, it's not a hard contraindication. Um, and of course, you know, individuals with beta blockers can be supplemented with both um, epinephrine as well as glucagon to uh, terminate an allergic reaction should one come up. But again, you have to kind of counsel your patients accordingly so that there are no surprises. In individuals who are younger than four, um, this is arbitrary. The data on this is also limited. Um, and of course, the compliance with the therapy due to the fear of needles is definitely there. Pregnancy, this is an excellent one to bring up. So generally, um, you know, the recommendations from our practice parameters have been that if an individual is pregnant and is asking about initiating allergen immunotherapy, generally we talk to them about the risks of that and um, do not proceed with initiating it while they're pregnant. However, if they're already on immunotherapy, and then they come to you asking, you know, what can I do with my immunotherapy? You have options um, that you need to have kind of a risk benefit discussion. And I will say allergists differ on this because the data is so sparse on this. You have an option of terminating the immunotherapy, knowing that they have to restart once conception has happened. You have an option of continuing immunotherapy at the current dose that they are at if they're in the buildup phase. If they're in the maintenance phase, you just continue the maintenance dose. And then a third option um, is to continue immunotherapy, including escalation of doses, which um, I personally do not practice. Um, I have practiced the middle option, however, of continuing immunotherapy in individuals who are pregnant, but not escalating the doses. But that practice, like I said, will, will differ um, from allergist to allergist. Any thoughts on that, Dr. Portnoy? 
Um, well, since I only treat kids, um, most of my patients are not pregnant, and that's probably a good thing. Um, I am a little bit reluctant to treat kids under four simply because they're afraid of needles and it's, but you know, it's, there's actually some evidence that younger children respond well to the therapy. It's just giving it to them can be challenging. An excellent point that Dr. Portnoy brings up. So what does that mean in terms of responding to therapy? So not only do they have clinical benefit, but there is data in not necessarily individuals who are younger than four, but in this younger age range, when they initiate immunotherapy, it could prevent additional sensitizations to different allergens in the future. And in individuals who have not developed you know, asthma, it could help prevent the progression of development of asthma. So and we're all into prevention, aren't we? <laughs> Indications for allergen immunotherapy. I think this is a lot of what we talked about already, but you know, if you're having issues with pharmacotherapy or if you desire to avoid pharmacotherapy long term, certainly with allergic rhinitis and conjunctivitis, that is an indication. If you have coexisting atopic conditions with asthma, rhinitis, conjunctivitis, that's an indication. With atopic dermatitis, that's the same. And then with um, hymenoptera reaction, um, again, uh, as outlined here, these are individuals who've had um, systemic reactions. Um, generally, uh, if you have just had a cutaneous reaction to immunotherapy, um, that you may not need to get immunotherapy. Now, I say may not because some allergists are still in the practice of initiating VIT in individuals who've only had cutaneous reactions. Um, but again, we um, when we reference the latest data on that, individuals who have systemic reactions are likely to receive the most benefit. Just, just a historical point that the, that form was developed by the Joint Council uh, which later became the Advocacy Council of the American College of Allergy. And it was recommended that whenever you provide immunotherapy to a patient, you clearly put down what the indications are for allergen immunotherapy. There, there was some legal reason why that was something that was really necessary. The Office of Inspector General actually uh, audited some allergists to see if they had the indications listed because they were going to find them if they didn't I didn't know OIG actually did that, but they apparently did, and it, it scared allergists. So they strongly recommend that you at least put down what the indication is, and it should be one of these indications. Awesome. A word on nomenclature. So um, allergy shot is kind of a colloquial term that we're we use in general um, throughout this talk, but really the term allergen immunotherapy en encompasses all different immunotherapy options. Um, this includes, as outlined here below, subcutaneous, sublingual, as well as oral immunotherapy. Um, I will bring up in later in the talk um, with regards to doing immunotherapy for aeroallergens, there's also some non-FDA approved modalities that you may hear about as well. But the purpose of allergen immunotherapy is to modify the allergic response to the allergen exposure. So that's generally what I do counsel my patients about when you know we're talking about risks and benefits for immunotherapy. Um, and then yeah, mentioning here that there's multiple routes that you can can do immunotherapy. All right, so allergen extracts. So for these, we have units that allergen extracts are um, expressed in, including weight per volume, protein nitrogen units, AU or allergy units, BAU or bioequivalent allergy units, um, as well as the concentration of a major allergen, which could be listed, like for instance, ragweed 10, 10 micrograms, AMBA A1 ML. The vials come labeled generally as the concentration, um, um, and then the dilutions from the maintenance concentration as well. Dr. Portnoy, did you have anything else to add about this? I mean, there's a whole historical discussion about where these units came from and why we have so many different ones. Why don't we just all use micrograms per mil or something simple like that, but we don't. And it's a long history. It's very interesting. I don't think we have to go into it here. Sure, just just yeah. keep in mind that pay attention to what the units are, but when you mix weight per volume, PNUs, allergy, when you mix all that stuff together into a vial, it's not really clear what to call that. Mm -hmm. There's so many different units. So that's why the 
practice parameters recommended, just call that the maintenance concentrate. That's the top bottle that you use to treat the patient. And then dilutions from that can be one to 10, one to 100. And don't worry about the actual units of potency of each component in the maintenance concentrate. Very good. With types of allergen extract, we have, of course, aque aqueous with human serum albumin, glycerin, allergoid polymerized T cell peptides, as well as immunostimulatory uh, sequences, such as allergen CPGs. The type of, uh, type of extract, excuse me, currently used in the US, off the table or board, a single syringe is used to draw extracts from various vials when the patient arrives, and a single injection is given. Shared single vials is where you have separate injection, uh, separate syringes used in each vial and multiple injections are given. Yeah, have you ever heard of these? Um, <laughs> well, I've heard table. this specific terminology actually. Well, I, when I was a fellow, we did off the table and a lot of allergy practices and especially in the New England area, that's what they did. They, they insisted that that had to be one of the options. Basically, you make the extract each time the patient shows up. So you've got all these mm. stock bottles and you're drawing out of them when the patient shows up into one syringe and then injecting that into the patient. Uh, I mean, I, I was trained to do that. And of course, I don't think that's a very good procedure for reasons that we'll see in the next slide. But uh, that is, I don't know if it's still commonly being done, but I know at one point, many allergy practices did off the table. And then we have shared mixtures, which are common mixtures that are prepared with dilutions, and the extract is drawn from the shared vial when a patient arrives. And then lastly, patient-specific vials. An extract is prepared for each patient based on their sensitivity. Dr. Portnoy, my personal experience, I have seen these last two used. Of course, at our institution, we do patient-specific vials. Yeah, I think that's become pretty much the norm now, in part because that's how Medicaid, Medicare pays for allergen extracts by individual vials. So it kind of forced everybody to move to that, to that model. Absolutely. General rule of thumb is ideally if you can prepare a patient specific vial. I mean, that's certainly what we, we do at our institution. And when you have those, you individualize them to each patient with identifiers. It reduces the likelihood of error and likelihood of contamination. Of course, this information is always verified when you are when you have that vial with you and you're ready for administration when the patient comes in. This includes an effective dose for each component, and it avoids mixing incompatible extracts, um, such as if you try mixing mold with cat or dog or mold with mite or something like that. It avoids the inclusion of cross-reacting allergens, or excuse me, antigens, and then can be prescribed for a manufacturer or mixed in a practice. You know, a lot of practices buy stock bottles and then mix their own. Um, we we generally just write the prescription and send it to the manufacturer and they prepare the extract, mm -hmm. partly because our volume isn't that high to justify having the concentrate. And because we're hospital based and with Joint Commission regulations, it becomes very hard for allergists to sit in a conference room or a room and mix extracts. It has to be done in a pharmacy by a licensed pharmacist. And it just it was just not possible for us to do it that way. And this last point here, you have to be, of course, um, USP 797 compliant in order to do this. You asked me about my experience with this. So those guidelines, Dr. Portnoy, actually came after um, I was doing this um, previously. Mm -hmm. So we will see that, though, in a later slide right here. So the USP 797 is a set of enforceable sterile, compound, um, sterile compounding standards, and it applies to compounding pharmacies and facilities involved in the preparation of um, uh, immunotherapy for us. So there's a media fill test if you mix extracts, um, and there's a whole set of guidance, that, of guidance and um, uh, specific, I guess, rules that one needs to follow or guidance measures one needs to follow in order to be USP 797 compliant. Um, so assuming that these are mixed in a pharmacy or mixed at, you know, a allergen company or mixed in your practice, um, these are regulations that we do need to follow. Yeah, this came about because of the, you know, there were a long time ago, there was a a contaminated vial of uh, steroid that was being used to inject into spinal fluid. I, I, 
it had fungus in it, and then all a lot of patients got fungal infections and died from it. And so USP came up with these regulations to try to prevent contamination like that. They wanted to make sure that compounding pharmacies knew what they were doing. Unfortunately, they decided that allergy practices were a compounding pharmacy. We're going to require that allergy practices uh, follow the same regulations as a pharmacy would, which would be very impractical for most uh, practices. So uh, the academy and the college, I, I think it was the advocacy council worked very mm -hmm hard with USP to come up with some modifications so that allergists, if they did this media fill test and showed proficiency in sterile mixing of extracts, that they, were, they could continue to uh, practice the way they had been. And the specific regulations and guidance with regards to this is going to come out on the newest um, allergen immunotherapy uh, practice parameters. So stay tuned. All right, the potency of currently available manufacturer extracts. So we're going to talk about um, standardized extracts kind of in a, a, a following slide, as well as non-standardized extracts. But the potency is going to differ based on the individual allergen that we are looking at. Um, and you can see all of these individual um, allergens that are listed out here. The potency differs, the units differ that we um, use them for. Um, and again, just highlighting AU stands for allergy unit, BAU bioallergy, bioequivalent, excuse me, allergy unit, and PNU protein nitrogen unit. Let's look at this a little bit further. All right. <clears throat> now, this is definitely something both for clinical practice as well as for examinations um, that is important to know which extracts are standardized and which extracts are non standardized. So, currently, our standardized extracts include house dust mite, cat, grass, as well as uh, short ragweed. We can see the labeled potency or concentration here in the middle uh, column and the probable effective dose range. So all of this is going to differ um, kind of based on, um, you know, what, uh, which provider or which company, I guess I should say, you are using for um, mixing allergen immunotherapy and then ultimately what size of vial you're um, going to um, end up putting in in terms of mills that will differ. But that should correlate with what effective dose range you're trying to get the patient at so that they have ultimately clinical benefit from the allergen immunotherapy. We can see our non-standardized extracts include dogs as well as molds and other um, tree pollens, for instance. These are all um, non-standardized extracts that can be expressed in weight per volume or PNU per ml. Um, and these are the probable effective dose ranges for um, CANF1 for dog and then for uh, other extracts not listed here as well. Dr. Portnoy, did you have anything else to add about this? Um, just to say that it's a chocolate mess. This slide is very old, and unfortunately, nothing's changed, so it hasn't really been updated. There, yeah. there just hasn't been that much effort placed into standardizing extracts. The yeah. probable effective dose is based on clinical studies that showed effectiveness when that extract was used at that dose, yeah. and that's, that's how they came up with that. Yeah, very true. So assuming that you have a patient who is, um, assuming that you have a company that does a 5, five ml vial and a patient who um, receives a 5 ml vial, I say patient because this may even differ within a company in terms of a pediatric patient or an adult patient. Um, when we take into account this, everything we saw in the last two slides, these are the potential um, doses expressed in mills that we can add to our immunotherapy vials um, to ach achieve some type of efficacy for our patient. But I do want to put a caveat that, again, this may, this may differ if you have a different sized vial um, for the patient. This is assuming a 5 ml vial. Yeah, if it's a 10 ml vial, just double it. Yep, um, I used to exactly. spend a lot of time doing the math and going through all of the filling and incremental and stuff. But if you actually do the math, you, you come up with this table, and this is very simple and quick. You can just look at this table and add this amount, and that will give you an effective dose. Very good. 
Um, all right, let's talk about the nomenclature for labeling dilution. So this is pretty standard across um, all companies um, that provide allergen extracts. When we have the highest dose or highest concentration, I should say not highest dose, highest concentration is going to be labeled as the red vial, which is a one to one um, concentration that you have. Um, in terms of practically how you know shots are made, they're actually all made based on um, when you have the red vial. So these dilutions are subsequent dilutions that come from the red vial. Of course, we know that the yellow vial is the first dilution, the one to 10, and then the blue goes to one to 100, green one to 1,000, and then silver one to 10,000. Depending on your practice with regards to silver vial, there are a few different uses. If you have someone who's really um, quote unquote sensitive or you're very concerned that they may have a systemic reaction or they've previously had a systemic reaction within the green vial, then you know that's somebody that you would consider a silver vial for. Additionally, if you're considering potential accelerated schedules for immunotherapy, some of those accelerated schedules also have the silver vial listed in there. So how this correlates with the actual vials that, you know, we are given from, you know, the patient. So the, the top uh, delineates those individual colors that we have listed out here. The um, allergen kind of um, vial here will also list the extract, the dilution, um, and then you should have all of the patient identifiers on here. All of this, like I said, should be verified at every appointment that the patient comes to get immunotherapy um, in order to um, ensure that there are no dosing errors that occur. Um, anything else that you had, Dr. Portway, for this? It's a nice picture. I, I took it. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, great yeah. skill. You know, before skills. the practice parameters recommended this color scheme, every practice had their own color scheme. So you would open a refrigerator in a private office where you got extracts from different allergists and there would just be a rainbow of all these different colors oh, and wow. nothing. Yeah. So by standardizing it, the whole the goal was to make it safe. And we Absolutely. got some resistance from practices that used a different color scheme. But I, I think eventually everybody saw the, the value in having a single consistent scheme like this. So it's kind of the traffic light thing, green, yellow, and red. And Absolutely. since there aren't four traffic lights, we put a blue because it's a pretty color. <laughs> Thanks for that perspective. All right. Now, in terms of the recommended expiration times for the dilutions, um, these are generally the, um, you know, what's listed uh, once the extract is, is done being prepared. So these expiration dates should also be listed on um, the individual, you know, extract or vial that you've, um, have, you have for the patient. Um, mm -hmm. All right, let's talk treatment schedules. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So with treatment schedules, you're, um, whether you do a standard schedule or whether you do an accelerated schedule, both constitute having a buildup phase or the maintenance phase. The buildup phase um, has receiving um, doses of the allergen immunotherapy in sequential escalating order um, in order to get to the highest dose, which is ultimately uh, where we do the maintenance phase at. If you do a standardized schedule or a standard schedule or a weekly schedule, I should say, um, you can receive the injections. We're assuming that we're talking about SCIT here or subcutaneous immunotherapy. So you can receive one injection per week, which is what a lot of practices do. However, other practices may receive injections twice per week or even three times per week if you're like on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. If you do receive injections multiple times per week, generally you separate those out at least by 48 hours. Um, any uh, way that you do this on again on a weekly basis they may take this may take anywhere from three to six months so again families should be or, and patients should know that right off the bat so their expectations are there with regards to what that will look like the maintenance phase begins once the effective dose is achieved and um, the effective maintenance dose of course depends on the level of allergen sensitivity and response during the buildup phase um, so in terms of the maintenance phase, different allergists do this different ways, and this also differs between aeroallergen immunotherapy and hymenoptera immunotherapy. So with aeroallergen immunotherapy, 
these injection frequencies can be spaced out from two week, um, from every week to every other week, every three weeks to every four weeks. Generally, um, you know, most of the data in terms of maintenance dosing for aeroallergen immunotherapy is right um, at four weeks in terms of the most duration you go between injections. With venom immunotherapy, that does differ a little bit. Venom immunotherapy, there is data to suggest that spacing out even to six weeks still um, allows for clinical benefit in the patient. So what your maintenance dose is kind of depends on which immunotherapy your patient is on and ultimately what they're able to be compliant in. One last point I want to mention about that. So Sometimes you may have patients who are on, let's say, shots every four weeks or um, subcutaneous immunotherapy every four weeks. They may have recurrence of symptoms at maybe the, the third week mark. And so that could be a moving discussion that you have with the family to potentially increase the frequency of injections, even while they're in the maintenance phase. So different allergists have different practices with that, and you will kind of experience that while you're in your fellowship. In terms of symptomatic benefits, so there may be a decrease in symptoms during the buildup phase. However, in terms of receiving a kind of clinical benefit, um, generally we see this at at least 12 months on the maintenance dose um, to see kind of a, a clinical improvement. And this goes to say if a patient is on shots, let's say for three months, and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm really not getting benefit from the immunotherapy, you do let them know that, well, you know, the, the data suggests here that we're very early in the immunotherapy and most individuals receive benefit after an ex a longer time, i.e. 12 months um, of immunotherapy. And then if allergy shots are successful or if subcutaneous immunotherapy is successful, maintenance treatment is generally continued for three to five years. So there are accelerated schedules. We're going to see an example of a cluster schedule. There's also rush and ultra rush, which are options, which are a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, rush schedules can accelerate in one in one visit anywhere from starting at the silver vial going up to the red vial or starting at the silver vial going to the yellow vial and which rush schedule you use um, will have a different um, systemic reaction risk um, and that'll that is based on kind of different articles that we have with different protocols for rush immunotherapy one thing to note is that you know while multiple studies have been published um, you know, a lot of the studies with regards to that have kind of smaller subsets of patients that we're looking at. So it's just something to take into account when you're counseling your patients. Generally, when you do ultra rush immunotherapy, you're um, significantly reducing the amount of injections that you're giving the patient you're, and you are achieving maintenance dose within that same day. Practices may do cluster and rush on an outpatient basis. Generally, if we're talking ultra rush immunotherapy, um, that you do talk about having this patient stay inpatient in order to complete this. But generally, like I say, most allergy practices can do cluster or rush on an outpatient basis. Now, one last point I wanted to mention. When I, we talk about rush immunotherapy, the risk of systemic reaction differs pretty significantly between aeroallergen and venom immunotherapy. Venom immunotherapy has a much lower rate of systemic reactions with um, rush therapy um, that's kind of been reproduced in studies compared to aeroallergen. Um, so you may see uh, rush immunotherapy for venoms, you know, as a part, as a routine part of the practice wherever you are. Um, but the practice with regards to aeroallergens may differ just depending on what the allergist is doing or allergists are doing. Assuming you're on a weekly schedule, again, this is kind of the time frame between buildup and maintenance. Um, and then maintenance, you know, you can receive, again, like we mentioned, uh, injections either once a month or every two weeks, et cetera. Here is an example of a cluster schedule. And Dr. Portnoy, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you might have been on the paper um, that actually published this. So cluster schedule um, gets you to the maintenance phase faster than what a weekly schedule does. Um, but it differs in terms of rush and ultra rush. Rush and ultra rush, you are getting through multiple vials in a single visit. Cluster outlines going through um, multiple vials potentially spread out over multiple visits. So this specific protocol um, outlines getting to rush over um, about eight 
visits um, and assuming that and a lot of people who do cluster immunotherapy generally they do each um, visit on a separate week um, so when you receive let's say you're at visit number one um, your green vial may go down to 0.05 in terms of your you know your weekly schedule that you have but at cluster you start a little bit higher and then you do get to the second dilution so the one to 100 dilution or concentration within the first visit. And then you can see in the second visit, you get to the yellow. Once you get here, you know, your, your risk of systemic reactions does increase a little bit. So you can see that um, the amount of injections and the concentrations of each in injection that you receive subsequently differs a little bit. So it's a little more accelerated in the first three visits, and then you kind of build up more slowly to the maintenance dose to reduce the risk of systemic reactions. Dr. Yeah, Portnoy, did you have any comments? Yeah, this is one of those so-called accelerated schedules. Uh, you mentioned earlier that people can come in there twice a week or even three times a week and get one injection. You can do cluster by coming in once a week, twice a week, or even three times a week also. The difference between cluster and just giving uh, more frequent uh, weekly injections is that you give multiple injections in the same visit. Um, so you give an injection, you wait 30 minutes. If they're not having any reaction, you can give a second injection and then they wait another 30 minutes. Um, this is helpful for people who are in a rush or hurry to get built up to maintenance. Uh, if their schedule uh, permits this, it's particularly helpful for college students who can stop by the health center between classes and maybe spend an hour studying or doing something while they're waiting to get their cluster schedule. It, it just makes it more convenient for them. Absolutely. Um, and one other point to mention um, is in individuals who undergo cluster immunotherapy, rush or ultra rush, um, there is a lot of um, data about doing pretreatment for these patients, um, especially more for the rush and ultra rush. When we talk about the standardized weekly schedule, um, individuals may not receive um, any pretreatment you know, prior to receiving their injections. Um, and then lastly, in terms of these accelerated schedules, of course, one of the main benefits is the faster you can get to maintenance, um, it does help with compliance with patients, especially if you have somebody who's really busy and it's really difficult to come multiple times a week. So um, in terms of my personal take on this, I do certainly talk about this with patients. Now, one other thing to mention about that. If you are offering these accelerated schedules, do know that if someone is, let's say, sensitized to ragweed and you're in ragweed season, generally they don't recommend rush and ultra rush um, at the time that, you know, it's, it's peak allergen season, especially if the patient is, is having a lot of symptoms with that particular allergen in that season. Um, so that's one thing to, to kind of think about. Um, but apart from that, yeah, these accelerated schedules are excellent. Okay, so informed consent, of course, this should be obtained um, before administering um, allergen immunotherapy. And most importantly, we should be discussing that as allergists with the patients, including what the treatment is, alternatives, risks and benefits, including the risks of any allergic reactions, costs associated with immunotherapy, anticipated duration, and any specific office policies. Pre-injection questions to ask, and generally these are asked um, depending on which question this is at every visit. You verify that you have the correct patient with the name and date of birth, and you verify that with the vial that you have in your hand. You verify if a patient has had um, worsening asthma or allergy symptoms, or if they've had any illness type symptoms as well. Um, you also talk about were there any problems with the last injection? Um, although we assume that if a patient had a you know, systemic reaction with the last injection, sometimes they don't disclose that. And so that does need to be you know, asked about at every visit. And then if they're on beta blockers or ACE inhibitors, you do wanna know that as well, if they've been diagnosed with new medical conditions. And then of course, if, um, if someone is pregnant, you wanna know about that as well. In terms of these injections, so as the name denotes, this is a subcutaneous injection. This is not a intramuscular injection. So the technique to do this includes pinching the skin in the upper arm, insult, inserting, excuse me, the needle, pulling back to check for blood. Um, and if there's no blood, you know, inject subcutaneously. If there is blood, you want to try again. You remove the needle and apply pressure for about 30 seconds. 
after the injection, um, most practices, as well as our practice parameters, advocate for waiting 30 minutes after each injection because systemic reactions occur in that time frame. Patients should be checked before they leave, asked about any symptoms, check for site reactions, um, check for other symptoms. It is possible to react longer than 30 minutes after injections, so that is a possibility. So it, it brings up this last question here, should patients be asked to carry epinephrine? I say this because while your practice may have every patient carry an epinephrine auto-injector, that practice varies depending on you know, where you are um, you know, seeing these patients. Not all practices require, um, this is not necessarily a requirement advocated in our guidelines. However, um, you know, if, if your practice kind of requires it, you do wanna discuss that with the patient. Okay, and then in terms of local reactions, so this is obviously a big um, side effect that can occur with allergen immunotherapy, which results in having erythema, swelling, heat, even hives at the injection site. Um, right now, uh, we don't see conclusive data that large local reactions are pr uh, predictive of future systemic allergic reactions, which is generally why even if someone has a, uh, a local reaction like this, we don't we don't have to modify the shot schedule, let's say if you're in buildup. Um, if persistent large local reactions happen, you can pre-medicate, of course, decrease the dose uh, or rate of buildup for the patient comfort. And then if using a single vial, consider splitting into two smaller injections. And this is an example of what um, a local reaction looks like. Dr. Fortnite, any points that you had about this? I usually think of large local reactions as a function of injection technique more than exquisite sensitivity to the allergen. Different injectors might get different outcomes. Sometimes you just accidentally go through a nerve or something or blood and, and it causes this reaction. So I, it, it's idiosyncratic and unpredictable and doesn't necessarily happen each time. Systemic reactions, of course, can occur with allergen immunotherapy, and that is something that they should be counseled about um, in terms of a risk of this therapy. Symptoms can include, of course, anything um, in this list here, urticaria, angioedema, erythema, flushing, increased respiratory symptoms, pending dooms, uh, pruritus, GI symptoms, uterine cramping, because um, women have smooth muscle in the uterine tissue, which is why we get um, cramping in this area. Hypotension, tachycardia can also happen as well. And generally, these are rapid in terms of onset. However, um, overall, with, especially with a um, standard weekly buildup schedule, um, with a, also a standard maintenance schedule, the risk of this, or incidence, I should say, of this is overall pretty low. Yeah, I always thought it was silly about the feeling of doom until I actually had a patient who said, I, I have a feeling of doom, and then I take mm -hmm. it seriously. But so I actually had a patient who said that specific word. If you hear that word, then be ready to treat anaphylaxis. All right. Factors that may increase the risk of systemic reaction include symptomatic asthma, high degree of allergen hypersensitivity, using beta blockers, dosing error, previous systemic reaction, injection from new vials, or injection given a, um, during a period of allergy symptom exacerbation. One point I also mentioned with the accelerated schedules, too. Epinephrine is, of course, the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. Um, with 1 to 1,000 as the standard of care. Our doses may differ depending on whether you have an adult or uh, a pediatric patient. Um, and of course, the epinephrine, if administered, should be administered intramuscularly in the lateral thigh. Consider placing a tourniquet above the injection site to slow the antigen absorption, which can reduce the severity and speed of the reaction as well. Have you ever done that? I don't know that I have ever done that, Dr. Portnoy, but also I will say that most of the systemic reactions that I've seen with allergen immunotherapy have uh, resolved within um, a single dose of epinephrine, but um, I know that this is something certainly that we can do. Yeah, I mean, the reason you give it in the arm right there is because there's enough space above it to put a tourniquet. You don't do it in the thigh or the abdomen or someplace where yeah. you can't apply a tourniquet. That's the reason for that look. Yeah. If somebody starts to have a systemic reaction, a tourniquet can sometimes be faster than epinephrine. So while somebody's getting the epinephrine, put the tourniquet on. Within seconds, the reaction will turn off. It's it's just 
amazing how quickly the reaction will just stop all of a sudden. Uh, the patients will say, gosh, I feel better immediately. Um, if you put it on one arm, you can inject the other arm with the epinephrine. And then once the epinephrine is in, then you can release the tourniquet. And that way the reaction will stay controlled. Uh, just something that I think all fellows should know about. Um, sometimes these reactions can be so fast, there's just not time to grab the epinephrine and inject it. Definitely. Um, treatment for allergy shot reactions. Uh, so although steroids and antihistamines can be given, these are not going to stop any systemic symptoms that the patient is having. These are going to be more for comfort for the patient. Uh, well, let's forget steroids for one second. I'm speaking just strictly about H1 antihistamines. They um, can be uh, effective in terms of reducing pruritus or the discomfort from the urticaria or let's say angioedema that the patient is having. Um, but generally um, for shot reactions or um, immunotherapy reactions, we know that H1 antihistamines can be beneficial and there is not strong or conclusive data with regards to corticosteroids or H2 blockers. Oxygen and bronchodilators, of course, if you have concern about bronchospasm for the patient. And then if you have um, hypotension and, uh, you know, uh, vascular collapse concerns, of course, you would be administering fluids, vasopressors, and then um, calling 911. And um, this is why generally we do recommend doing these in an allergist or um, a medical office um, rather than families receiving this at home so, so that if, some, if somebody is doing this are you ready to use the tourniquet <laughs> i mean at this point i would hope that i've already applied the tourniquet and and not waited until this long <laughs> exactly Dose adjustments um, is something that definitely comes up in practices based on a couple of different things. Over time, if you have a new vial um, for the individual that comes up, if you've had a systemic reaction or if you've had missed injections. So all of this um, kind of varies a little bit, again, depending on practice practices, but a lot of the information that Dr. Portnoy has written out here is based on kind of um, data from multiple articles that are um, put together. So over time, um, you can um, make adjustments, like I said, to spacing out um, to up to every four weeks for patients. And then, like I said, er for every six weeks, this um, I've seen this done for aller allergen immunotherapy. I know for sure we do this for venom immunotherapy, but um, this should be under the guidance of an allergist. And then um, if you have a new vial, we know that potentially there is a, a little bit more risk for systemic reaction with that. So you reduce the first dose by 50%. And then if tolerated, you res resume the full dose. Following a systemic reaction, so this practice, you know, differs a lot between, you know, individual practices. One approach you can take is to reduce the next dose by 50%. Um, another approach is, you know, decrease back one vial. Um, and also a part of this may, may vary based on how bad the systemic reaction was for the patient. Um, and of course, for these modifications, this should be done under the guidance of an allergist. And for missed injections, if you're on a weekly schedule, you reduce by one step for each missed injection after three weeks. So if it's been longer than that, you do need to calculate out how many additional um, you know, steps you go back. And then if you're on every two weeks, reduce by one step for um, each miss, missed week after six weeks. But again, if you get longer than that time window, you need to need to kind of calculate that out. And then if on monthly, you reduce one step for each missed week after eight weeks. So um, keep, keep in mind, these are these are from the practice parameter, but they are based on expert opinion. Right. There clearly were no double blind controlled studies of each of these recommendations, proving that that's the most effective one. So this is just what the experts thought was the best advice. Is allergen immunotherapy efficacious? So we see data um, with regards to this on um, a large uh, study, essentially, or a large review that looked at 51 clinical double-blinded placebo-controlled trials that evaluated both symptom scores and medication uses, medication use, I should say. And there is a statistically significant reduction in symptom score. Now, of course, in order to know the most information about this, I highly encourage you to actually look at the article because um, they specify which allergens, you know, were used 
to see this benefit in in patients. Um, medication score data also showed an overall reduction in the immunotherapy group. So again, um, the details with regards to this in terms of which allergens were used, what schedule was used, which, what duration were used is in this article, but there's also many articles that have come out since then that we do reference with regards to that. The bottom line is that, you know, allergen in immunotherapy is overall an effective um, therapy that we have at our arsenal for patients. And although we discuss the risks and benefits with the family, we do know that this is something that can be beneficial for them long term. Dr. Portnoy, do you want to talk about the odds ratio with this? Well, the odds ratios are just how much more likely uh, the uh, immunotherapy is to be effective than the, the placebo. Um, so a higher odds ratio just means a greater effectiveness of the active treatment. As you can see, most of the studies, this was a long time ago, so there are almost certainly newer studies, but most of the studies back then were done in dust mite. Mm -hmm. um, but there were also some other allergens that were measured also. But I think dust mite continues to be the most studied allergen for uh, immunotherapy. Definitely. So dust mite here has the highest odd, odds ratio that we can see on the chart here. Um, and then some of these do kind of outline which other um, aeroallergens, specifically pollens, um, could have higher odds ratio like this, including grass pollen, potentially birch pollen, ragweed pollen. Um, and so... Bottom line is that we do know that this is a, a overall an effective treatment therapy. We see this with higher, um, with with more conclusive data, I should say, with specific allergens, and then overall, like I said, it's an overall safe therapy for I'll us. Point to out do. this is this is for asthma. The previous one was for rhinitis, so it works both for asthma and for rhinitis. Correct. Yeah. And then effective um, effects of immunotherapy on symptoms and progression to asthma with uh, periteria. Um, so this is a study, I think, from 2004, right, that looked at um, individuals who underwent immunotherapy between 1998 and 2000 um, and compared individuals who underwent um, placebo therapy. So individuals who had um, uh, symptoms of asthma who were under placebo had much higher symptoms compared to individuals who underwent the actual subcutaneous immunotherapy. Actually, so what, we, it, what it's showing is that Patients with just rhinitis are less likely to then develop asthma if you've given them immunotherapy. So it prevents the development of asthma in people who started out with just rhinitis. Definitely. And that's something we, um, I kind of mentioned as well, um, especially mm -hmm. if you're talking about doing it in younger patients too. Yep. Total duration of shots. So this is also going to differ based on, um, you know, practices, but individuals who undergo immunotherapy for a year are likely to relapse with their symptoms. However, we've seen longer term benefit um, in individuals who complete at least three years of immunotherapy. Now, some practices will do up to five years of immunotherapy, and then some practices will even do beyond that. But we know that the data exists for um, at least up to three years of immunotherapy. Um, Okay, let's this see. was this was a placebo trial just showing that after three years the patients continued to do better than placebo. Uh, the reason we say three years and not more than that is because the, there haven't been any studies longer than three years to show that it works even better. All right, now this is a quick point that I added. I know that we're getting close to time here, but there are some FDA approved products for sublingual immunotherapy. And there's two ways that sublingual immunotherapy is done. First is using allergen extracts to make drops basically for the patient to take sublingually. And the second is FDA approved tablets. So these tablets are approved in these age ranges. So Timothy Grass is for individuals five and above. The five grass pollen tablet is for five and above as well, as well as ragweed. House dust mite is currently only approved at 12 years of age and above, but we know that it can be beneficial even in patients who are younger than that with regards to um, rhinitis, asthma, and atopic dermatitis. Um, the making of the sublingual drops, like I said, is um, something that is widely done um, throughout the country, but it's um, your individual practice may have differ, differing 
you know, whether they do it or not. And an intralymphatic immunotherapy, I just want to mention this here because um, there is, um, this is a type of immunotherapy that is done. It is not an FDA approved immunotherapy, but you may see um, information about this at the conferences and um, hear about this from, especially from private practices. Yeah, have you ever used SLIT? I have used the FDA approved SLIT. Yeah. I have okay. not used commercial extracts to make slit drops. Oh, okay. All right, summary on allergen immunotherapy. We know that AIT can reduce the sensitivity of an allergic patient to their allergen. Indications of um, immunotherapy include being sensitized, having exposure, evidence of symptoms, and then informed desire to get AIT. Medical conditions currently approved for AIT are listed here, rhinoconjunctivitis, asthma, atopic dermatitis, and hymenoptera allergy. We do have contraindications that we need to be aware of, um, both with me uh, medical conditions as well as medications. Using patient-specific vials is a general um, approach that is taken. Um, vials need to be properly labeled in order to prevent dosing errors. AIT needs to be given safely. Um, and then the total duration um, is generally about three to five years. All right. Sorry, Dr. Miller, for going over a little bit. No worries on that. Um, I think for sake of time, we'll, we'll hold off on any questions. You saw the emails that were available. I'm generous of you to put those up. Um, thank you guys for your expertise and sharing all this good information. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you. come back on Monday and we'll do it again. Right. Thanks, everybody.